video is broadcast on LSL Podcast Channel. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe to the channel. Let not your heart be troubled. You are listening to the Sean Hannity Radio Show Podcast. All right, so I have insomnia, but I've never slept better. And what's changed? Just a pillow. It's had such a positive impact on my life. And, of course, I'm talking about my pillow. I fall asleep faster, I stay asleep longer, and now you can too. Just go to MyPillow.com or call 800-919-6090. Use the promo code Hannity, and Mike Lindell, the inventor of MyPillow, has the special four-pack. Now, you get 40% off two MyPillow premiums and two go-anywhere pillows. Now, MyPillow is made here in the USA, has a 60-day unconditional money-back guarantee and a 10-year warranty. Go to MyPillow.com right now or call 800-919-6090, promo code Hannity, to get Mike Lindell's special four-pack offer. You get two MyPillow premium pillows and two go-anywhere pillows for 40% off, and that means once those pillows arrive, you start getting the kind of peaceful and restful and comfortable and deep healing and recuperative sleep that you've been craving and you certainly deserve. MyPillow.com, promo code Hannity. You will love this pillow. Clients are with us. Welcome to the Sean Hannity Show. Uh, it's a happy Friday for everybody, but our friends, our neighbors, people we know down in Florida. We'll start the program. I, our thoughts and prayers are with you. Hang in there. Hang tough. Americans are tough. Floridians are tough. Um, I know none of this is going to be easy. This is the big one. I hope those of you that are being told to evacuate or evacuating, um, uh, you know, there's some amazing stories to come out of what's going on now in preparation of Hurricane Irma. Uh, just to let you know, we'll have Joe Bastardi on in each hour of the program today. We're also going to be doing some news, and that would include Freedom Caucus members Jim Jordan, Congressman Dave Bratt. The rest of the Republican Party pretty much sucks, except for the Freedom Caucus at this point in my life. I just had it. Pat Buchanan will join us. The Attorney General of Florida, Pam Bondi, is here. Well, before I get to the good stories, let me just say, I talked to Pam Bondi's office today, and she'll come on and, and talk a little bit about it. She's getting a lot of calls. There are some crappy people out in this world that are out there charging 30 40 bucks for a case of water. Now, what's the average cost for a you know, case of water? Three, four bucks, right? All right, charge an extra dollar. If you really you need the money that bad, two dollars extra, fine. Got it. I understand. But why are you going to gouge people in what is really the hour of need that they have and and anyway she's been investigating and then on the other hand and this is always the case you see goodness and greatness emerge in people and i think and i'll ask the attorney general when she comes on i think it was jet blue the first to do this they're offering 99 dollar flights out of florida 99 bucks and you could take your animals for free because nobody wants, you don't want to leave your cat. Look, if I had to leave my dogs, I wouldn't go. You got to take your animals with you. So um, they're people too. Uh, I mean, I couldn't imagine leaving my house and saying goodbye to my dogs. It's not going to happen. And I think most people that have pets are like that. So the airlines are being considered. Then I think American followed with the same amount. Um, I'm not sure. Delta, they had some high prices i saw but i think they have some low fares too i don't know but and then you've got other companies like home depot and when i was talking to pam bondi's office earlier today they actually said that the guy the head of home depot who i know and i've met and i've known him for years and he's out of atlanta great guy i probably wouldn't be good if i mentioned his name so i won't bother him but they called her and they said what could we do and then you've got gas companies And they're doing everything that they can do to get gas because they were having some gas shortages. And, you know, maybe a couple of gas stations are gouging, but then the rest of them are not doing that. And they're even, you know, they're even putting people at the pumps to try and expedite the service because the lines are long and people are frustrated. So it's you see goodness and greatness. And and like Texas now, knock on wood here, Governor uh, Rick Scott has been amazing. And he's been warning everybody for days. He took the information. Can you imagine living in an era where you, we didn't have meteorology or satellite imaging? Imagine living in a world where you're just going about your daily business in Florida today with no idea one of the biggest storms ever to hit your state that will engulf the entire state is heading your way. and You have no idea it's coming. Well, that's what life was like before we had satellite imagery and 
and we had forecasting. And I know it's an imperfect science. We give Joe Bastardi the hardest time if he's off by an inch. And meanwhile, it saves lives. And what I like about Bastardi more than any other meteorologist is he knows the history. And he can tell you what happened in the 1800s. And, the, and he can tell you what happened in the 1929 storm. And he's also figured out that there's certain, if you will, roadmaps or or pathways that these storms take, especially when you recreate the exact same conditions that existed when the storm happened back, quote, in the day. So I think, you know, that's why I think he's been so accurate as it relates to both what happened in Texas. And he's been dead on accurate here. And for my friends in Florida, I know it's inconvenient. There's some 650,000 people now that have been told to leave South Florida. Now, this is a really, this is it. It's serious. And I think the governor made a great point again and again. Every time he's been on TV, he's been telling everybody for days, you know, they have pre-positioned. And this is where government can really work well in people's lives. And I hate government. I despise governments. You know, look at the Republicans in Washington. They just suck. You know, they weren't ready to do a debt ceiling increase, and they were off for the whole month of August and almost the whole month of July. We've actually passed more bills. All right, I don't want House to hear this right now. Pre- we'll get to that later in the program with the Freedom Caucus guys. But it's frustrating. Anyway, but to the, you know, to the ever-growing credit of Governor Abbott, the Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick of, of Texas, then we've got, in Florida, we've got Governor Rick Scott, I mean, he has handled this pitch perfectly and knows the knew the potential at the first forecast. And he's been preparing the state of Florida. And he's been coordinating. I, I talked to a friend of mine that works in the White House today. The calls that have gone back and forth between the president and the governor, the president, the attorney general, the president and, and local politicians or or the chief of staff, General Kelly, have been a tremendous back and forth and cooperation. We even have our Defense Department is already pre-positioned for warships off the coast of Florida, you know, so that they're ready to bear down and and help the people of Florida, which we now know is is inevitable. It's not a question of if it's when we get to go in there to help people out. And the our friends and neighbors in Florida are going to need the help of the American people. There's going to be devastation. Uh, God forbid there's no loss of life, but you always have these weather warriors that want to, you know, they're going to stick it out and and they think they can beat Mother Nature. And I don't think they're being particularly smart, but I'm not going to I'm not going to send a helicopter and force them out of there. Everybody's been warned. And we had the mayor of the Florida Keys on the program yesterday, and, and they've done a pretty good job. This is really the first time the Florida Keys has been evacuated the way they've been evacuated. But it looks like the Florida Keys, it looks like Miami, it looks like even the eastern side, although it's made a more westerly turn, you know, the Palm Beach, Broward County area is all going to get hit and hit hard. And But it looks like if I were to guess right now, we'll ask Joe Bastardi at the bottom of the hour, my guess is this is a direct hit on, on my second home, which happens to be, and I don't, you know, I mentioned that and people say, you're thinking about, you. I don't care about my place. You know, I, I want every person that lives in Naples and I know a lot of people down there because I've been going down there for years, not much, like once a year. But I want all my friends down there to be safe. I want all of my friends in Fort Myers to be safe, Sarasota to be safe, all my friends in Miami to be safe. That's all I care about. And as the governor said, you can rebuild your homes, you can get property back, but you can't get your life back. So if you've been told if you're one of the 650,000 that has to bear the traffic and the long lines at the gas station and some em- empty shells, they've done a very good job. I've, I've been talking to my sheriff buddy, Carmine, and I actually posted a, a news article about him. You know, the sheriff's office in Florida, uh, in Naples, and Collier County and Lee County, they've been going absolutely nuts getting everybody that needs help off the streets and pre-positioning. The federal government is now pre-positioned in safety zones out of the way of the hurricane, all the food, water, medicine, baby formula, cots, blankets, and pillows that they're going to need. And so, you know, right now we just got to, you can't evacuate the whole state, so now everybody's got to bear down and and accept that this is going to be the big one and get your plywood, get your tape, get your supplies, get whatever you can. More supplies are coming in, so stay in contact with your local stores. More gas is coming in. The governor's best decision a couple of days ago was getting 
all the neighboring states to lift their regulations so they can import more gasoline immediately into the state of Florida. That has been successful. You got literally, you know, tens of thousands of of FEMA government workers now on the ground and prepositioned to go right in following the hurricane to help those people that are going to need assistance and rescuing. So, um, and for the few people that are trying to take advantage of this situation, you really suck. There's something wrong with your soul. You know, if you if you can't help your neighbor out in need, and, and this is your opportunity to gouge people, you just suck. I mean, yeah, maybe you can get 30 bucks for a case of water. Great. I hope you sleep well at night. No, I'm serious. If you can't, this is all hands on deck. So... Anyway, about 650,000 people now, and I know the traffic, and the, my, my best counsel advice to my friends in Florida, just, just take a deep breath, listen to this program, we love you, we'll try and distract you for the next three hours in your ride, and my buddy Mark Levin will take over from there, hang in there, and, uh, and we'll get you home, and we'll get you to a safer place. Mar-a-Lago, by the way, that too has been evacuated. Anyway, the fuel shortages now, the, the good news I'm hearing, they created an app. Hey, um, Linda, can you get the app and put it up for people where there are restocking groceries, they are restocking the gasoline, so we can make sure that we can help people because they created an app. So people, you go on the app and you'll know whether or not you're wasting your time online at a particular gas station or spending your time driving to a store that doesn't have anything in it. So I thought that was particularly helpful as well. Anyway, it has now, but you've got to understand it's not just Naples, Marco, the Keys, Miami, West Palm, Palm. It's it's not just southern Florida. It's the whole state is now engulfed in this, all the way up to St. Augustine and Jacksonville and central Florida and Orlando and Miami. It's everybody. All of you are going to get hit by this. This hurricane now, it's not a matter of if, will engulf the entire state. And what's scary about this, as we've been telling you, it's this is going to deliver a very destructive blow. This is the real deal here. So I'm just urging everybody to please take caution and be smart. And we want you back here listening on Monday. And there's nothing that's going to make me and everybody else happier than to be, write a check to Samaritan's Purse and say, all right, we're going to help you rebuild your lives, just like we're helping the people of Texas rebuild theirs. So, but it has taken a more westerly turn. And by the way, this isn't just for the our friends in Florida, because immediately after it gets out of Jacksonville, it, it's going from Savannah straight up through Atlanta into the Carolinas. So it'll, it, Georgia's going to get particularly hit hard. Uh, the coastal Georgia areas are going to get ha- hit hard. Atlanta is going to get hit hard. As I said, the greatest evacuation in history: six hundred and fifty thousand people ordered to leave Florida. If you want to know how bad some people are predicting this is going to be, the FEMA chief, Miami Beach mayor, warning, get out now. This was two days ago. This is a devastating nuclear hurricane. So do I want you to be afraid? Not fearful, worried, scared. I want you to be proactive, scared. In other words, I want you to just take it seriously, get your provisions, create a safe place wherever it is that you're saying, hunker down, bunker down, and we're going to do everything we can do to get everybody back up and running. And I know the American people are the most generous people on earth. And and I know it's inconvenient. I know it's a pain in the neck. And I know for some of you, you're scared out of your minds. I understand it. But being scared, it never pays to worry. You get nothing out of worry. You get nothing out of being fearful. You do a better job if you just stay focused on what it is you need, the provisions you need, the safety precautions you need to take, and the things that you're going to need to get through a few days until help arrives. Because it's not going to be overnight. You're talking about the entire state that is impacted here. All right, we got a lot coming up on the program. We do have the Attorney General of Florida, Pam Bondi. We do have every hour this uh, day on the Sean Hannity Show. Joe Bastardi is going to be checking in. Also, Pat Buchanan, Freedom Caucus members Jim Jordan and Congressman Dave Bratt will also check in on this Friday. 800-941-SEAN is our number if you want to join us. Hang in there, our friends in Florida. Our hearts, our prayers are with you. We love you. We need you back here with us on Monday. Please be careful. And we'll have the latest with Joe Bastardi, Pam Bondi, and much more straight ahead. So speaking at the press conference earlier this week, the Florida Governor Rick Scott, he told state residents to turn to apps and other online resources. Now, one of them is Gas Buddy. 
It's an app. You download the app, and, and it tells you what gas stations have what, which is just such a, a great resource for you. And then you, can, of course, can use Google Maps and Waze and, and Expedia and all sorts of things if you're trying to fly out, and some extra flights have been added late, especially, I think, out of Orlando and Jacksonville and and Miami and, and Naples and some of these other places, uh, Fort Myers, rather. So... Anyway, they're doing everything they can do, and because they've been on it a couple of days, maybe the station yesterday didn't have gas, but they have it, and they have the prices up, too. Um, and I see that everyone is pretty much within the same range, $2.60, 70 $0.80 a, a gallon. Not, you know, it's nothing that bad. Um, and in addition to Gas Buddy, the governor noted that the state is working with Google to keep its mapping app updated with the most current information. You don't want to drive into a road closure. They're giving you real-time traffic. You know, obviously turn into your local news talk radio station. We've got great stations. We've got uh, Fox News Radio in Naples. We've got WIOD in Miami. We've got our station in West Palm. We've got our uh, station in Jacksonville, WOKV, WDBO in Orlando. I mean, every, we got Tampa, WFLA. I just can't mention all the stations. And every we have every cordon and every inch, square inch of Florida covered, so you can find us on the radio and tell friends to find us. And most of our stations are doing weather and traffic updates. And if they're taking time out of the show, that's perfectly acceptable uh, under the circumstances. We know uh, how important this is for our friends down in Florida. So um, we've got a lot coming up. Let me let me tell you, we'll have uh, Pam Bondi, the Attorney General. She'll join us in the next hour. Joe Bastardi is going to be with us doing a hit. All three hours of the program today. Pat Buchanan will do some politics today. We'll get his take on the pathetic state of the Republican Party. Freedom Caucus members, the only people I like now in D.C., the only non-sewer swamp creatures. Anyway, we'll have Jim Jordan, Congressman Dave Bratt checking in today. But, again, our top story, Hurricane Irma bearing down on the entire state of Florida. All right, buckle up, folks. This is the big one. Solid as a rock. Honest. Truthful. This is the Sean Hannity Show. The Lebanon evacuation zone in these counties have been ordered to evacuate Lee, Hendry, Palm Beach, Broward, Miami-Dade, Monroe, or Collier County. You must evacuate by midnight tonight or find shelter to avoid life-threatening impacts. If you're in this area and are planning to leave and have not done so by midnight, do not get on the road. It will not be safe for you or the law enforcement needed to protect you. Again, if you're planned, if you're in these area, those counties, if you're planning to leave and do not leave by midnight tonight, you will have to ride out this extremely dangerous storm at your own risk. I think about my mom and how hard it would have been for her to be completely broke and have kids and have to evacuate. But you have to do it. You can't afford not to do it. Think about your family. You have to keep your family safe. Evacuations are not convenient. They're meant to keep you safe. We want all evacuations to be safe. I'm glad so many people are driving to safe places. Now the largest evacuation ever. We have some other news here for you if you're in Florida. 25 now till the uh, top of the hour. Talladega Super Speedway, the Atlanta Motor Speedway, are offering free campground space for any Irma evacuees, which is good to know. Um, I got to believe probably because it's in a racetrack that probably would be protected, well built, hurricane proof. Um, look, I, I'm not I don't know. Talk to your experts. I mean, you're hearing on, you know, from the governor, from the attorney general is going to join us later. They'll they'll give you all the latest on this. But, you know, whether this lands or a cat four or five, I don't know. The good news is that. The governor and the attorney general who will join us later, they they have been now all over this for a long time, and that has led to the evacuation of 650,000 people. Uh, I understand through these applications that I put up on Hannity.com that you can literally get gas. You can find out exactly at Gas Buddy, the app where you can get gas. They also have differing uh, apps that are available that will tell you exactly where you can get food and supplies and and they're restocking so if it's even an hour ago if they didn't have something they might have restocked between now and then uh, the ports had remained open the entire time the federal government literally has pre-positioned food water medicine supplies baby formula blankets cots and people that are apparently all ready to come in four navy ships are off the coast out of the way of the hurricane that are literally now going to be engaged the the second they're out of harm's way and moving right into the the state of florida also with supplies 
Um, as I understand, now we have the National Guard, State Guard, all have been called in and on duty. Everybody's all hands on deck at this point, which is great news. But it's still now it's going to engulf the entire state and the evacuations are real and the bottlenecks and the driving challenges are real and the aggravation factor is real. But you can't, you know, literally when it now is impacting as the potential of affecting and will probably affect every city in the state of Florida. Nobody is going to come out unscathed here. Every, the whole state is going to get whacked. And then it's going to move right from Savannah, Georgia, up through Atlanta is going to get hit particularly hard, right up the coast to the Carolinas. So this is going to be, you know, buckle up. This is going to be a long process for everybody here, and a lot of people are going to need help at the end of this. And we already have making contact with Samaritan's Purse and some other organizations. And you know what, from uh, Linda, I, I think you told me earlier that the Cajun Navy, they're going to be going up there, and, and all of these different groups that are former military, former law enforcement, you know, they're doing exactly what they did in Texas, exactly what they did in Baton Rouge, and they're just using their professionalism, training, their expertise to get on the ground and help those people that need help. There's going to be people that didn't evacuate, they need help. And it makes it harder for everybody when some people don't listen. But what are you going to do? You just we will do our best. We're going to try our best. We just can't guarantee that we'll get everybody out. Um, it looks like it has now taken a more southwesterly turn here. And we're going to get Joe Bastardi on in just a second because this is a catastrophic storm surge. Greatest evacuation, it's called, in, in history of 650,000 people. What is Sunshine laughing at in there? What is, what is going on with uh, CIS over there? What is it? I'm not at liberty to discuss this issue. Why not? Oh, is that on the do not talk about list? I have been told that I am not allowed to discuss this issue. So that's uh, what? She signed an NDA. Did you really? <laughs> yes, I did in blood. FEMA chief, Miami Beach mayor warning, get out now. This is a devastating nuclear hurricane. Now, I, it's still not too late for a lot of you. You can still... You know, we're talking about this, and we'll bring Joe Bastardi in here. You still have time to at least get off the coast and get inland a little bit so you're at least away from the storm surges. Um, it makes a difference, Joe Bastardi, weatherbell.com, the official meteorologist of the Sean Hannity Show. It does make a difference if you're off the coast, does it not, sir? Well, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, the storm surge is what uh, is a real concern because uh, you could – you could probably shelter yourself uh, if you have a strong enough shelter, but you can't shelter yourself from water. You can shelter yourself uh, from wind. Or though, let, let me say something that uh, what is going to happen with this in, in reading accounts of the 1935 Labor Day hurricane where people uh, literally the salt and the wind and the uh, rain literally blasted clothes off people. That's how strong that kind of wind is. And I don't think that people understand what this storm is capable of. We did some calculations here, and uh, we came up with this, that uh, we believe that the highest wind gust in the Miami area Sunday afternoon would be 100 to 120 miles an hour. Uh, when you're talking about Naples, Bonita Springs, Marco Island, uh, it may go over 150 miles an hour. The same thing wow. in the Florida Keys. When you get up to Tampa, Orlando, and uh, uh, Daytona Beach, that area, it looks like 100 miles an hour, a peak gust, probably coming Sunday night. Jacksonville, so I'm, what I'm doing is I'm bringing it up the coast here. Jacksonville, Monday morning, peak wind gust 80 to 100. A Atlanta and Savannah, Monday afternoon, peak wind gust around 80. Charleston, 60, Monday night. So you have a timeline on when the worst of this is going to uh, be moving up the coast. And this is what's going to happen with this storm is it is absolutely ferocious at the core where it hits. You're going to see it move almost due west tonight, and it may get into Cuba for a little while. When it comes out of Cuba and starts making that turn to the north, and we were uncertain yesterday where it was going to turn to the north. We're getting more and more certain it's further west now. When it comes across the Florida Straits, given the upper air weather pattern, the warmth of the water, with water temperature 88, 89 degrees, this system, I believe, unlike Katrina or Rita, which weakened in the last 12 to 18 hours, this system will be intensifying coming into the Keys and then into southwest Florida. So even though it's a four right now, we expected it to weaken because even though it went north of Hispaniola, it dragged some dry air from Hispaniola, 
this system may indeed be up to a five. I think its bar barometric pressure will be lower than what it was when it was out near Barbuda by the time it hits uh, the Keys and into southwest Florida on Sunday. All right, let's let's go through this and let's let's literally drive from uh, Miami all the way up both coasts here. So you think it's taken a little bit more westerly, and you thought this would happen early on, and not a lot of people picked up on it, but it's taken a little bit turn to the west, which means that if we're going to talk about it, the keys are going to get slammed. Great thing that the mayor was on yesterday told us they evacuated. Marco Island, uh, Naples, Miami. Fort Myers direct hit? Yeah, that, that area there from Fort Myers uh, down to the, uh, the uh, central part of the Florida Keys, that's a direct hit. In, and, and, and to the east of that, the upper Keys and toward Miami, the storm surge uh, is going to be very, very high. And, uh, About how high? In other words, the, the, the storm surge will go, what do you anticipate? Well, uh, I agree with what the hurricane centers got out in a lot of places. And you, you got to remember that the, we don't go up more than 8, 10 feet for quite some time. So you may have a storm surge 10, 15, 18 feet in some places uh, going just simply continuing inland. And that is a big, big problem. A lot of uh, the unfortunate thing when you look at uh, cities like New Orleans and even Miami, you're building them right on the coast. And it's not like you go straight up in the air. Uh, like you do in some of the other uh, northern coastal cities where they they rise 20, 30 feet very uh, quickly. Newport, Rhode Island, for instance, is 30, 40 feet above the ground. So even in a real bad storm surge, they can get away with it. But you can't do that down in these uh, southern cities. And, and the, the fact of the matter is the storm surge is high enough, so it's going to engulf a lot of these areas along the Florida coast. So that's basically what you have to be concerned about. What what we've done here, and they have uh, area A, area B, area C, that they evacuate based on the storm surge prediction. So if someone tells you in A or B, get out of there, you've got to get out of there. Like I said, you, you might you might be able to shelter yourself from the wind, but if there's water coming over your head plus the waves on top of the water. When we talk about storm surge, we're just talking about the raise and elevation of sea level. If you're piling 30, 20, 30 foot waves on top of that, you can imagine what's going to happen. So some of these places, some of these houses along the coast and condos, I'm not, I'm not trying to make light of your situation. There'll be beach battering waves uh, there. With all due respect, I don't have a, dry. I don't care about my stupid condo. With all due respect, I know I want people to get out of there safely. I just don't care. Um, as long as people are safe, L let's say you're well, on. Uh, yeah. let, let's say you're on the. I was making that point. No, I know, but let's say you're on any coast and you move in ten or fifteen miles. How much difference does it make? Because you just described a situation oh, I mean, where Miami and Naples and Fort Myers and and Broward County, I guess probably, and and maybe West Palm. It's going to be anywhere between 140 and 160 mile an hour winds, and by the time it gets up to Central Florida and Orlando. You're talking about maybe a hundred, and 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 when you get to, you know, places like uh, Jacksonville, it's going to be a hundred, then about eighty in Savannah and Atlanta, and then about sixty miles per hour when it heads to Charlotte. Yeah, uh, Charleston. Yeah, I'm sorry, Charleston. Sure, Charleston. Uh, that's all right. The, the Charlotte may get that, but that's the gust. The steady state wind will be a little bit less. So with a steady state wind, really is you almost can't comprehend it will be within 30, 40 miles of where that center makes landfall. And and to just have a constant roaring wind, it's like a freight train, it's like a tornado. It's like an F2, F3 tornado, except it doesn't stop. And then you have a wind gusts. You'll have wind gusts that come up maybe 10, 15, 20 percent higher than that. So if you're a steady uh, a one minute wind, for instance, is blowing 130, 140 miles an hour, and then a gust of 160, 170 comes along. I'm saying these things because people have to understand. It, now you could be brave with your family and the things you do, and take it a stand on this or that. This is not the time to be brave. All right, or you know, foolhardy. You get the heck out of the way of this thing because it means business. All right. What about those people that thought they were going to be really courageous and weather warriors? And I mean, crazy people like you, because, you know, you're a former ex storm chaser, which, uh, you know, I think is actually very cool. On the one hand, I'd really I'd love to be able to stay there one day and just watch it. But I'm just not willing to risk my life for it. Um, but those people still have time to get out. Right. I mean, if you're in the Florida oh, Keys yeah. now and you're listening to this program, you can still get out. If you're on the coast of Naples, oh, yeah. you, you should. 
You need to get out. Get out. I, I'm not. I'm not quite the crazy storm chaser. That, that you know, I I've seen enough weather. I'm more fascinated about what sets up the weather and what the weather's capable of doing than I am of actually seeing it. Uh, but the 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 fact of the matter is, it, it, you, look. Here's what happens. It's like being in quicksand. Once you realize you're in trouble, it's too late. And so that's what I tell people with these things. And, you know, if you study the history of Florida hurricanes in the 1940s, the 1930s, the 1920s, the great Miami hurricane, if you study the history of those hurricanes and understand what they're really capable of doing, you would understand that this is you, – you've got to get out of the way of this thing because we've returned to that era, at least for this storm. Yeah. Uh, All right. So the last thing that I would say is, so when does it actually hit? When will they start feeling it in South Florida, Southwest, Southeast Florida? Well, you'll start feeling it tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow night. The storm's delayed about 6 to 12 hours, I think, uh, as far as the uh, the landfall from what I was uh, bringing up with you yesterday, because it's making more of a turn to the west, and so it's more distance uh, to go before it comes out of Cuba, uh, Cuba or on the north coast of Cuba. So the real, the worst part of the storm is coming across the Florida Keys Sunday, late Sunday night, and I think the landfall, the actual, the eye crossing the coast is probably uh, probably Monday afternoon or uh, Monday afternoon, maybe at noontime, right around Marco Island. So you've got a long haul here where from Sunday afternoon or Sunday morning, it's in the center of the uh, Florida Straits. Yeah. It's coming, it then comes across the Florida Keys and then comes up just a little bit offshore before coming in. And you think about that funnel, that, that cup-shaped bay We've got in to run. southwest Florida. But that's where it's going to happen. Yeah. All yeah, right, jo- Joe Bastardi, weatherbell.com. Now, the good news, Joe is going to be with us every hour of the show today. Uh, so we'll talk to you in, well, about... 50, uh, 40 minutes from now, thanks, uh, or 45 minutes from now, Joe Bastardi, weatherbell.com. You can go to his website, of course, get all the latest information, updated forecasting, of course, as this will engulf the entire state of Florida. Hurricane Irma, we'll have more on that. Also, Pat Buchanan, also Pam Bondi will join us in the next hour with Joe Bastardi. She's the Attorney General of Florida and Freedom Caucus members Dave Brad and Jim Jordan. Uh, my only advice, please be careful, all our friends in Florida. I want to remind you, did you see what happened this week? It was one of the biggest security breaches ever, one of the largest credit reporting agencies. Um, Equifax had a massive breach, 143 million Americans. Did you see that? Anyone with a credit history, pretty much. Now, I, this isn't a time to do a LifeLock ad, but by the way, I'd get LifeLock.com because LifeLock detects all of these threats, and if you have a problem, they'll fix it for you. I've obviously talked to Director Mulvaney uh, yesterday evening uh, after this deal was announced. We want to see a longer-term debt uh, ceiling bill that has real conservative structural reforms, and obviously we didn't see that yesterday. What does that mean? In other words, you would have preferred to see spending cuts attached to this, not in this case a spending measure, in this case emergency relief. Yeah, and I mean, the emergency relief, I believe that should have been a standalone, but uh, that's a tactical question. But really, when we look at the debt ceiling, we've got to get our spending uh, really under control. Uh, Neil, you know it. uh, I know it. uh, The American people know it. And so if we're going to do that, we've got to address this debt ceiling uh, uh, vote with some type of structural reform. And so uh, in that, uh, I've I've just left a, a meeting where we're talking with our leadership on how we do that to make sure that Chuck Schumer doesn't have the power. 
But as a speaker trying to push through a conservative agenda, do you believe that Paul Ryan has been an effective speaker of the House? Well, I think here, here's the interesting thing is, is as an effective uh, speaker, the only thing that you can judge that on is the results. One, right. one of my favorite quotes is, no matter how beautiful the strategy, we must occasionally look at the results. And the results uh, and the time remaining for that jury to make a, a judgment call on those results is running out. We've got to be very, very aggressive in our corporate rate. So if we're looking at a corporate rate of 25 percent, that's a non-starter for, for most of us. We have to make sure that the hardworking American taxpayers, that they get the break too. So not just special interest groups, we need to make sure that those that uh, moms and dads that need to put money back in their pocket, that it actually flows through to them. All right. There, of course, you are hearing from the Freedom Caucus. And I'm, I'm going to be blunt, truthful and honest, as always. Uh, they are the people that I trust in Congress today. They, they are the ones that I have the most faith in that they will adhere to their conservative principles and, and focus on solving the country's problems which should be at the forefront of everybody's discussion and debate in the country, but everybody's so focused on Russia, 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 when there's no evidence at all to this point. Anyway, joining us now, he is the former chairman of the Freedom Caucus, Jim Jordan of Ohio, and in a second will be joined by Congressman Dave Bratt. Um, I'm, let me first start. I guess Congressman Meadows is, is basically downplaying any friction or divisions with Ryan, um, there was some divisions during the health care issue because nobody got to saw the bill, they, they see the bill beforehand. Yeah. It was an establishment bill. Uh, it was thrust on everybody, and it took a lot more work than otherwise I think would have been necessary. But you guys worked, you know, many, many weeks and months to try and fix it. What is the status with the relationship with the caucus and with the leadership now? Well, it's fine, Sean, but, but the, the most important uh, relationship is the relationship that Congress has with the American people, and right now it's not very good, and it's not very good because we're not doing what we said, and, and you know that. And you talk about that every single day, and we appreciate that. So that's the key here, and, and frankly, on this most recent deal, um, it's not a good deal because any time Nancy Pelosi is supporting something, you know it's not good for the American taxpayer, but what, what options, what choices did President Trump have? I told I told our conference today, I said, lack of preparation leads to bad outcomes, and failing to make a decision is a decision in and of itself. So the problem was we didn't put together a debt ceiling plan. The only people who offered a debt ceiling plan have been the Freedom Caucus. We said cap spending going into the future. Do some structural change. We've offered plans. I, you know, I'm we so – Stay here and discuss those. I get so angry when you tell me that Congress wasn't prepared – um, didn't you guys pretty much take a July 4th holiday, then you took an August recess? Yeah. and So, I mean, yeah. I would think you come back and you're ready to hit the ground running considering – and Paul Ryan, God bless him, last night was making the case to Martha McCallum that this is the most productive Congress in history. And I'm like, huh? What do you – let me, let me play it for you. We've actually passed more bills in the House for the president and his agenda in this first six months of his administration than in the first six months of Obama, Clinton, and both Bushes. The House has passed 316 bills. That's a record pace. Now, 260 of them are still in the Senate. The Senate's busy working on judges and appointees and the rest. But the House has been extremely productive, not just extremely productive. The House has been more productive than any Congress in the modern era. What's your response to that, Jim Jordan? By the way, Dave Brad is with us now, too, from uh, Virginia. What, what, about, what about the key elements of the campaign, Sean? What about controlling spending? What about tax reform? What about the border security wall that was a central element of this campaign? What about health care repeal? So while we might have passed a lot of bills, they weren't the, they weren't the centerpieces of what the campaign in the election on November 8th was all about. And you're exactly right. We took the longest break. Back nine weeks ago, the Freedom Caucus had a press. We said, do not leave. Do not leave until we have an outline of the tax plan, until we deal with Obamacare, until we have a plan on the debt ceiling. And instead, we took the longest break we've had in over a decade for a non-election year. In fact, the break we just got back from was longer than some breaks we have taken during election years. And you know how politicians like to be back home during election time. This six weeks was longer than some of those. 
So that was the problem. We should have been here like we called for in the Freedom Caucus, stay here and get plans put together so that we can take the case to the American people and actually do what we said. You know, Congressman Pratt, I'm looking at this as a 14-week window that the Republicans have to actually get some things done. And, you know, I don't know why anybody was floating the idea of a 25 percent corporate tax. That, that is not what the president was talking about when he was talking about 15 percent, seven brackets to three, a middle class tax cut, a repatriation of multinational corporations. Uh, getting rid of things like the double tax, death tax, and, and other improvements, and turning, I guess, the, the tax system into a postcard so that people don't have to, uh, you know, agonize over paying their taxes every year. Yeah, no, you hit it on the head, and I'll, I'll get at the leadership uh, question a little bit, because leadership promised in the Better Way program a repeal of Obamacare, right? And we also promised free market outcomes, price transparency, HSA, health savings accounts, all these free market apps shopping across state lines, and what do we end up with? None of that in the bill. And so that's water under the bridge. Uh, under the bridge. We'll just consider that a sunk cost. But now taxes is up, and it's everything you just outlined, right? So that's the hope, and everybody is assuming that, but we have nothing on paper, and I think Jim was just alluding to that too. So the Freedom Caucus, we're asking – we're going to vote on a budget uh, reconciliation instructions coming out called a budget resolution. That, that will contain no real budget going forward. The appropriations bills are already done. But it will include the tax instructions, and we're going to take a vote on that, and we haven't seen it yet. So I remember, uh, Sean, how frustrated you were last time. I was like, I'm going to put all you guys in a room until you get to yes, right? So you ought to sound out the alarm right now again. Put us all in a room right now, today, and say, let's see that tax plan, because we got to make sure the forgotten man, right? That, that wasn't just a Trump phenomenon. That was Bernie all the way through Trump. The forgotten man, they know they've been getting ripped off. We know we're going to get a corporate rate, but the S-Corp, the small business, we got to make sure that's in there. And then the repatriation, just all the stuff we assume is going to end up in a Republican bill. Uh, if it's there, I, I, right, listen, I, I, so we can all be on the same team. I've got to be honest, you, you guys who are the only people that I really have any faith, hope, and confidence in in Washington, and I, I'm so frustrated, I can't even explain, and, and as is my audience, because it should be about those very people that made the difference in this election, and that's the forgotten men and women. I mean, you guys in Congress are fine, I'm fine, but there was a point in my life where I was anything but fine, and so I, I totally relate to where they are, and I know these problems are infinitely solvable if only these conservative principles would be followed and the thing that frustrates where is the identity what does this party stand for the the president has outlined a reagan s this is reagan all over again tax plan for this economy and you add to that the millions of career jobs in energy if we become energy independent and and commit to it and i just for the life of me you know here it is september and they're not ready again how can they not be ready again? Sean, it's frustrating. Um, you're exactly right. What's the corporate rate going to be? Uh, no one can say right now. So what, 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 we, we need those. We, you just need the, the outline of a plan. Introduce the bill. Let's have the debate like we're supposed to, and then we'll get something done. Um, that's the frustrating part. I, I think we could have got there on a lot of these issues if we just stayed here and, and put the plans together. Unfortunately, we did it. All right. So, well, I guess we're back to the drawing board. Now we got to start again. Yeah. So, you know, from my perspective, I think the only reason the president gave a a three-month extension on the debt ceiling is he wanted to get the money over to the people in Texas because those people yeah. are desperate. He doesn't. Have, you don't have time to mess around when when everybody's life has been upturned like this. I mean, those people yeah. need the money fast, Congressman Bratt. Yeah, no, I agree with you. But uh, Mnuchin came over, Secretary of Treasury, Day, and it was uh, intellectually insulting the way it was sold to us. Uh, they had, he, his representation was, we have to do this to save the treasuries. And then some of the people said, you got to do this for the folks in Texas. It was a 100% vote. There was no question on any of this, right? You're going to raise the debt ceiling, and we're going to take care of the people in Texas. It would have been a 100% unanimous vote, but you got to add one phrase. And we're going to take care of fiscal concerns going out in the future so we don't throw the next generation under the bus. And that was missing, right? So we got jammed. They linked the debt's clean debt ceiling increase to the Harvey relief, and that that's unacceptable, right? And that, that makes it very hard for us to communicate with the American people as to what's really going on, and that's the swamp in control, right, the money. And so on net, we're not worse off, right? It, it's a three-month. Well, listen, I, if they can't year. do 15 percent, can they do 16, yeah. 17 max? 
You know, twenty five percent is you know it's like they don't want to stand for anything. And it, here's my gut instincts, and I'll throw it to you, Congressman Bratt, first. I I think the following needs to get done. If if you guys want to get reelected, I'm not. Ta- I'll listen. I'll, I'll go to bat for every Freedom Caucus member because you are the guys that. The only guys that are fighting for conservative principles. But if you don't get done this tax plan, this economic plan that will create jobs and invest the trillions for multinationals, corporations, lower the middle class cut, make the tax code easier. If you don't move towards getting those energy jobs, there are millions of them. And you don't build at least 300 miles of the wall and begin to chip away at Obamacare. You guys, you know, all bets are off. And watch Nancy Pelosi have a chance to become speaker again. Good luck with that. Yeah, no, that's right. And so sound the alarm because Obamacare is not dead. And Jim Jordan has been good leading and Mark Meadows on that. That's a trillion dollars we need to do tax reform and get that right that we're missing. The border adjustable is a trillion. Immediate expensing is a trillion and a half. All right, stay right there. I want to ask you about the border when we get back. All right, as we continue, Freedom Caucus members, Jim Jordan and Dave Bratt, thanks to both of you for being with us. All right, so let's let's talk about DACA, the president's decision. First of all, I, I, I know that some of my conservative brethren were mad about it, but I'm like, well, the president said he followed the rule of law, respect the Constitution, co-equal branches of government. Obama recognized and then did it anyway that he didn't have the authority the constitutional authority to assert the role of the legislative branch. Uh, And I thought the president saying, "Okay, it's up to you guys if you want to change the law, give you six more months. I thought it was actually pretty gregarious on his part. And it's up to Congress to make the laws, not not up to the president. No, you're exactly right. Uh, Obama knew his executive order was unconstitutional. He said several times prior to making his executive order that it was unconstitutional, but he did it anyway. And he did it in 2012 in the spring of that year because it was a reelection campaign year. And he thought it would help him. So what the president has done says, let's get back to the Constitution, let's get back to the rule of law, and um, uh, let, let's give six months time frame, a little wind down time frame, for Congress to get this done right. And I think what will happen is this will be the catalyst to get what we all campaigned on, what the American people elected President Trump to do, which is build the border security wall, like you said. And what do you think, Dave Brett? Do you think that if my list would be good enough to say, okay, we're getting our promises, we made promises, promises made, promises kept, if you got the, t- the economic plan in place, the tax cuts in place, repatriation in place, energy independence in place, and 300 miles of the wall built and maybe chipping away at Obamacare? Is that enough to get us into 2018? Yeah, no, that's the great agenda. And on DACA, right, DACA and immigration is all about jobs, and that's what Trump ran on, right? So we got welfare reform uh, we got to get through. we got to improve the labor markets. And then at the left is serious on this DACA and immigration. First of all, you got to do E-Verify, and then you got to end chain migration because the, the mainstream media is saying 800,000 dreamers, et cetera. And America has always been a country of immigrants. We love uh, everybody. But it's not 800,000. When, when you link it to chain migration, every one of those people can invite their entire extended no. family, not just mom, dad. So it's three to four million. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come down there and I'm going to put the Freedom Caucus in a room and we're going to start kicking ass down there because I'm tired of the inaction. <laughs> oh, I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm so tired of the lack of urgency and how pathetic the Republican Party is. Your party sucks. I'm just telling you, your party is awful. You, uh, you and millions of Americans are frustrated, Sean, and that's why it's time to get to work and get this stuff done. Well, my, my producer's looking at me like, well, you, you know, there are members of that party. I'm not saying I, I am making, I'm carving out an exception for the freedom caucus and i'm not being i'm not being flippant here this is i'm not this is not hyperbole get your job done you know everybody else yeah. in america rolls up their sleeves every day in ohio and virginia and we all go to work every day there's not one yeah. person that works for me that has a lunch hour I, I'm, I'm so tired of this they come yeah, back from a month-long vacation and they're not prepared for the debt ceiling yep and one thing sean you do a great job on those lists and when you say the party sucks uh we ought to be held to an objective standard and that's the party platform in virginia we have the virginia republican creed we have all these documents that make our principles very clear right and then for some reason we can never execute on those principles when it says constitutional free market fiscal responsibility that's on paper. So the people ought to hold us 
up to that standard. The idea that Chuck Schumer and Pelosi want to get rid of the debt ceiling altogether. They're, they're taught, right? It shows you everything you need to know about the two parties. Ours is better, but we have to follow our own creed. All right, guys. Thank you both for counting on you. We'll probably be coming into town next week or the week after. Look forward to seeing all of you. Hope okay. you'll come on the show. And I just think this is it. We now, I, I feel if we don't get involved and get very angry and get adamant about demanding they do their job, I, I just think they'll just coast along and not do a thing. We shouldn't have to get angry after you made promises. Do your job. But we'll remind you. And we'll put as much pressure as we need to put on you to do it. We'll continue. Bold, inspired solutions for America. This is the Sean Hannity Show. If you, leave, if you live in an evacuation zone in these counties have been ordered to evacuate, Lee, Hendry, Palm Beach, Broward, Miami-Dade, Monroe, or Collier County, you must evacuate by midnight tonight or find shelter to avoid life-threatening impacts. If you're in this area and are planning to leave and have not done so by midnight, do not get on the road. It will not be safe for you or the law enforcement needed to protect you. Again, if you're planned, if you're in these area, those counties, if you're planning to leave and do not leave by midnight tonight, you will have to ride out this extremely dangerous storm at your own risk. School buses are aiding in evacuations. Please take advantage of this service. I am a father and a grandfather. I love my family. I can't imagine life without them. Do not put yourself or your family in harm's way. If you've been ordered to evacuate and are still home, please go to a shelter. I encourage everyone to check on your neighbors. If you know somebody in your neighborhood who is not evacuating and should, please contact them. Today is the day to do the right thing for your family and get to safety. This storm is wider than our entire state. Think about that. It's wider than our entire state. It is expected to cause major and life-threatening impacts from coast to coast. Remember, Hurricane Andrew was one of the worst storms in the history of our state. Irma is more devastating on its current path. We are being very aggressive in our preparation for this storm, and every Floridian should take this seriously and be aggressive to protect your family. Possessions can be replaced. I think about my mom and how hard it would have been for her to be completely broke and have kids and have to evacuate. But you have to do it. You can't afford not to do it. Think about your family. You have to keep your family safe. Evacuations are not convenient. They are meant to keep you safe. We want all evacuations to be safe. I am glad so many people are driving to safe places. All right, that's the governor of the great state of Florida, Rick Scott. And, you know, you got to give kudos and props because... This storm is beyond devastating, and it is, uh, when you read some of the things we've been reading, the greatest evacuation in history, 650,000 Floridians have been ordered to leave their homes. Uh, You've got the FEMA chief, Miami Beach mayor, warning, get out now. This was yesterday. This is devastating, a nuclear hurricane. Uh, Literally, you have the federal government, they have four Navy ships on standby. They have all the materials at at different stations prepared to go in. They, in other words, they pre-ordered and delivered all of the resources they anticipate that our friends in Florida are going to be needing. Uh, we're told that, you know, traffic has been a nightmare. Everybody knew that was happening. Now for two days it's been a nightmare. And then you've got empty shelves in some places, but because the governor was so proactive and jumped on this, gasoline which had been in shortage and some of the empty shelves are now being restocked as he kept the ports open in florida up until and including today and some of the bottlenecks i know it's driving everybody crazy but um we don't want to lose any lives down in florida because this has the potential of affecting now every single major city in this state and then it's going to move right through georgia and savannah and atlanta and up to the carolinas so you know this is going to be a long haul here for a lot of people and it might be more damage than any storm we've seen in history. This, of course, on the heels of everything that happened down in Texas. But this is a powerhouse. This is dangerous. And even Georgia, South Carolina will be facing this catastrophic storm. 
Uh, joining us now to discuss uh, the latest on this, 23 now until the top of the hour, we have uh, Pam Bondi is the Florida Attorney General. Joe Bastardi back with us, weatherbell.com. He's been fantastic for us all week. Pam, we'll start with you. Uh, I've seen you all over the airwaves yourself. i got to give you and the Florida government, the governor, a lot of props here. I mean, this is the biggest evacuation we've ever seen, but you had plenty of time, and I think lifting the rules and regulations to get gasoline in and more supplies in, how has that worked out? From what I have heard, there's an app available for people that need gas and supplies. Yeah, Sean, there is an app, and, and thank you. And I can tell you, I want to thank oh, um, yeah. Scott Pruitt with the EPA as well, because we called we called General Pruitt, um, General Pruitt, he used to be my counterpart, we called Secretary Pruitt, and the EPA um, lifted the, the Clean Air Act standards on gas, where we can have blended fuel now for another additional 20 days to help us drive the prices of fuel down, which is going to help our state tremendously. I cannot thank him enough. Um, of course, the airlines are regulated by, by the federal government, the FAA, um, but the, I can't thank all the airlines enough. They have been incredible corporate partners. I have them on speed dial. Um, American, Delta, United, um, and JetBlue, they have tapped. I heard them. JetBlue was only charging 99 bucks to get anybody out of Florida in harm's way. Is that true? Absolutely. They've waived pet fees. These are all the airlines have done this. So what 99 bucks every airline? No, no, JetBlue 99, American capped all their fees, American at 99, out of Florida, everywhere. Delta capped theirs at 399 anywhere in the country, and that's the cap, the highest it can go. Um, United's done well. All air, all the airlines I've mentioned have waived. Well, i got to give pro- props to JetBlue. I mean, they're always the first. I love those guys. I love the uh, first people to put TVs in airlines, and that makes me happy. Uh, I know John, that you, they're, they're, they're great. They're great. Yeah. You gave a, a, a bit of an admonition about any companies who might be manipulating what's going on down in Florida, any price gouging issues when, you know, people are in need, which is a pretty crappy thing to do. Um, have you seen much of this? I, I sure have. And you know what, Sean? I'm going to say their name is every chance I get if they continue to do it. One you initially heard me go after was Chevron. Um, but, you know, you have a lot of franchise owners in South Florida, and there was one particular who was very bad. Chevron Corporate reached out to me, and they could not have been any better. They're threatening to pull these licenses away. And um, I have Chevron on speed dial now. They have been incredible. They really, really have. Uh, we've been having a problem with 7-Eleven stores. They're, they're based in, I think, Florida and the south, south, um, southeast United States. Um, 7-Eleven corporate just about an hour ago reached out to me, and they are all over it. You know, Sean, when we're in a state of crisis, there's no reason to drive up the price of bottled water. That's ridiculous. How much were they charging in some of the worst instances? Thirty, forty dollars a case. Some fifty, um, and that's 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 all of them. Seven Eleven was about thirty dollars a case. That of course should have been about three dollars. Home Depot re- reached out to me. Home no. Depot is charging two dollars and ninety seven cents a case of water. That's Home awesome. Depot corporate called me and said, "What do you need in Florida?" We said plywood. They had twenty trucks on the way. Sean, listen to this: three hundred and thirty five thousand pieces of plywood had been sold in Florida two days ago. So that shows Floridians are listening. That, that's really an awesome story. You know, we see always in, in tragedies. Uh, I can tell you right now, Pam, you're going to Pam, you're going to see the best in the American people. We're watching what's happening. We're praying for our friends down in Florida. You know, it's my my second home. I'd love it to be my first home, but it isn't. Um, but I, I know what's happening down there. And, and all of us are watching and whatever the needs are, just like, you know, we partnered on this program with Samaritan's Purse for the people yeah. in Texas. And we'll do the same thing. I'm sure I'm going to give. Franklin Grandma call again and have him on the program, and I know the American people will do their best to help our friends and neighbors in the in the Sunshine State. We, uh, you know, that's the right thing to do. The federal government. How has it been with the president? Have you talked to him? I know Governor Scott has talked to him a lot. Oh, uh, president called me a couple weeks ago. We talked for over an hour. I was in his office a couple of days ago. I was sitting in this office for with General Kelly. Um, of course, you know I adore the man. I, I was with the president, General Kelly, at, at great length, talking about the hurricane, talking about the opioid crisis, and I cannot give enough credit to Kellyanne Conway as well on the opioid crisis. Um, we've been all working on that together. Yeah, I was just with him in D.C. I have obviously came home early due to the hurricane, and um, the, the, I, I can't thank the, the federal government enough, and 
You know, you know, Sean, the, the, the DOD 1033 that the president did is going to help save our law enforcement officers' lives. I cannot understate the value. I can't overstate the value of that enough, what he's well, done with that. And if you're, your listeners don't know what that is, you can explain it to them or I can. Two days ago, a buddy of mine, Carmine, who lives in Naples, now Naples is in a direct path of this thing, just like Miami and just like the southeastern part of Florida. This now has moved west and will bring Joe Bastardi in here. I, I literally tweeted out this picture. They they literally have gone all over town, and they picked up every person that needs help, every homeless person. They brought them to safe uh, harbor and shelter. And, you know, you can see a, an image of it. Wink TV out in, in Fort Myers put a great story on about my buddy Carmine, and I put it up there. Joe Bastardi, you have the attorney general of Florida on here. Tell her how bad this is going to be because it's going to engulf the whole state and when it's going to happen. Well, uh Florida, of course, is legendary for hurricanes, and uh, if, if not so much over the past uh, 20, 30 years, but before that. And this may be as bad as uh, we've ever seen the state hit. Uh, the Florida Keys, uh, this could rival the 1935 hurricane in the Florida Keys, which is uh, the worst one on record over there. And um, we're also very, very concerned about uh, this being as bad as Donna was uh, back in uh, 1960 uh, in the southwest part of the state. So this is a very, very dire situation that we're looking at. And I, I, want, I want to compliment uh, what happened in Florida also. I've been down there the past couple of days, and uh, I was amazed this morning. I'm driving north now. Um, the gas lines were gone this morning, and they did a tremendous job at resupplying things. And so I did. I did want to pass that on to the attorney general. That was well, a, we got to give a, credit a very, to the attorney. We got to give credit to Pam and Governor Rick Scott and all the adjoining states that lifted their regulations from the get go when Governor Scott asked them to to get some gasoline and and lift the the burdens on trucks and and the process that could be very burdensome. And they got the gas, and they're able to you know get these people back on the road. And and the same with supply. I want to make sure that I want to make sure that we understand what's going on here with the weather, with the storm. I mean, I'm not the expert on evacuating people and things like that. This this storm is coming is going to be slowing down and being very close to Cuba for a while tomorrow. May delay the onset maybe six eight hours, but it's coming across the Florida Straits later tomorrow and tomorrow night, and the atmosphere is absolutely loaded for intensification. Unlike uh, Katrina and Rita that weakened coming to the coast over the last 12 to 18 hours of their journeys, this one is likely to intensify all the way until landfall. And that means that uh, when this comes across the Florida Keys, it may be as strong or stronger than it was when it uh, impacted Barbuda. And I'm very, very concerned that we're going to see uh, some of those bridges wiped out of the key. But when it gets to Marco Island, Bonita Springs, and these places, uh, this is, is probably a benchmark hurricane. Now, that does not mean that you let up on the East Coast, even though the direct, uh, the direct hit is not going to be in Miami and on the East Coast. It's still going to be a very bad storm. Where's the direct the hit? Where do you see the direct hit? I think it's going to be I'm becoming more and more convinced it's around Naples, Bonita Springs, after crossing the Keys. And I'm, I'm working on a situation. We By the way, alluding to this yesterday, Pam, we've told everybody that needs to evacuate. Right. And, and people are doing it. Pam Bondi. Sean, we have Sean. We have. I lost you for a minute because I'm in the middle of a downpour. Um, Sean, we have. And I'll tell you what. Floridians are actually listening. They're doing great. Governor Scott's been doing a great job. We've all been educating the best we can to everyone. And um, people are evacuating. They're heeding our warnings. They're getting out of town now before it actually becomes the, the truest of an emergency, and um, which it already is. But, but our roadways are safe. It's safe to drive out now. Our airports are all closing. Tampa International Airport's probably closed by now. It's closing today. But people need to get in their cars, get fuel. If you don't need a full tank of gas to get where you're going, don't use it. Take as much as you need and leave the rest for other people. That's something very All right, Pam, stay right there. We, if, you, if you could stay a couple of more minutes, and we'll have more with Joe Bastardi, weatherbell.com. You can check it out all weekend with the latest. He was the most accurate in Texas, and sadly, for what's coming to Florida, the most accurate here. But we use this information to stay safe. Thoughts and prayers, by the way, to all our friends down in, in the Sunshine State. We, uh, we're going to be watching, and we'll be here available to help. I can promise you that this country will not let you down. 
All right, went long last segment. All right, final word, Pam Bondi, Attorney General of the great state of Florida. And, Pam, I know I speak for everybody. Uh, your state, our friends in Florida, your thoughts and prayers are with us. We urge everybody to please pay attention, take this seriously, and be safe. Thank you, Sean, and look out for your fellow Floridians. That's what we keep telling everybody as well. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, and, and we'll check in with you on Monday. And, uh, Joe, uh, we're going to have you back in the, in the final hour of the program today, your final word here as we uh, head to a break. Well, we believe this uh, system will be uh, near the north coast of Cuba for a while tomorrow, but when it starts coming across the Florida Strait, that's when it means business, and I believe that it's going to be intensifying until landfall. And the landfall comes across the Florida Keys very late Saturday night and the Sunday morning. And then it looks like that Marco Island, Naples area may be where this hits directly. Entire state of Florida is going to get a hurricane and much of the state a major hurricane. All right. Really scary. I hope people are paying attention. Joe, we'll have you back at the bottom of the next hour. Thank you for being with us. 800-941-SEAN is our toll-free telephone number. You want to be a part of this extravaganza. A lot more to come. We've got a busy edition here on the Sean Hannity Show as we'll check in with Pat Buchanan at the top of the hour. Quick break. Right back. The latest on Hurricane Irma and your calls. 800-941-SEAN. We've actually passed more bills in the House for the president and his agenda in this first six months of his administration than in the first six months of Obama, Clinton, and both Bushes. The House has passed 316 bills. That's a record pace. Now, 260 of them are still in the Senate. The Senate's busy working on judges and appointees and the rest. But the House has been extremely productive, not just extremely productive. The House has been more productive than any Congress in the modern era. The reason I think that the storyline is that we haven't done much is because, in part, the president and others have set these early timelines about things need to be done by a certain point. Now, our new president has, of course, not been in this line of work before, <laughs> and I think had excessive expectations about how quickly things happen in the democratic process. And so part of the reason I think people feel like we're under underperforming is because too many kind of artificial deadlines un, uh, unrelated to the reality of the complexity of legislating may not have been fully understood. And of course, our political adversaries would be love to, love to say that anytime. So what I'm asking of you is to judge this Congress when it finishes. How much have we done? You're fired. All right, you're fired. Uh, anyway, glad you're with us. News Roundup, information overload hour on this Friday. We have more on Hurricane Irma and your calls coming up at the bottom of this half hour. Uh, there you hear Mitch McConnell. The expectations were so burdensome and out of whack. I mean, you know, we've only been promising for seven years, and and nobody under, the president obviously doesn't understand the, the happenings of Congress and the way the parliamentary procedures and how complicated they are, ever so are. And nor does he understand our work schedule. We only work about maybe 30 percent of the time because we have many vacations and on the vacations and junkets that you pay for. Um, we're very, very busy working in the pool. We're busy working, smoking cigars and brandy and coming up with the world's answers so that one day we might actually pass a bill and then of course when we're in session there's the senate dining room the senate workout room the senate barbershop all paid for by the little people not by us <laughs> but expectations are out of whack how is it that we ever expect that we're going to get something done after promising eight years we need at least eight years to work out the eight-year promise most productive Congress ever? I don't think so. Pat Buchanan is with us. You ever meet a more pathetic bunch of people than the people that are in the House of Representatives? Well, I think there's a, they have certain expectations. <laughs> yeah, what are they? American people are going to sit still for that seem to be out of whack, Sean. Well, they, they really are. I mean, it's just so bad. Look, I just had Dave Brad on, and I had Jim Jordan on. I, I happen to be the, a fan of the Freedom Caucus. These guys roll up their sleeves. They themselves save health care in the House. And it wasn't ideal, but it was actually workable. It was the beginning of chipping away at Obamacare. But, you know, Pat Buchanan, they didn't even have a debt ceiling bill, and they were off for nearly the whole month of August. And they come back, and they had no clue how to deal with the debt ceiling. So the president needs to get money to Texas, and he made a deal with Schumer and Pelosi. I don't blame him. I don't blame him in the least. 
I mean, he's a very much a can-do guy. He's a guy that gets buildings done on time and even ahead of time. Comes down to Washington, and they got the major piece of legislation, you know, dealing with Obamacare, which Republicans promised to do in three straight elections, and they don't know how to do it, and they didn't do it. I mean, I, I understand Mitch's problem with McCain and Murkowski and uh, Susan Collins, but I'll tell you, Sean, the way Mitch talks, you really wonder whether the, the Congress of the United States that presently constituted in this 21st century in a time of cable and internet and all the rest of it, you know, it's talking about doing a, taking two years to do, you know, a single piece of legislation, and that's, that's the way we work up here. The question is the relevance of Congress to the modern era. It's not simply the Republican Party. In the intermediate term in December, look, if, if they don't give Trump something on, on infrastructure or on tax reform or on immigration, on DACA and the rest of it, he's going to go work with Schumer and Pelosi because he wants to get, or he wants a record as president. He wants to work with Republicans to produce it. But if they're not going to produce it from their end, he's going to go find somebody that will. Well, it's that. And when are they going to get anything done? Now, look, Pat, they've got 14 weeks till Christmas and they've got a pretty big agenda. Now, instead of going with a, a 15 percent corporate tax and the president's plan, I, I happen to think it's Reagan-esque. Seven brackets to three. 15% corporate tax, middle class tax cut, repatriation, multinationals to incentivize them to bring trillions of dollars back to this country to build factories, and manufacturing centers. Then, of course, energy independence. Then the president gets rid of burdensome regulation to allow these businesses to flourish without government breathing down their neck every five seconds. A perfect business environment cu coupled with energy independence. We'd be golden in the economy. Sean, I would go certainly go along with that. I might have different, you know, different different things if I were down there. But if I were a Republican, I'd say, let's work it all out. Let's get something done we can agree on. We're not all going to be happy with everything. And let's get our tax bill down to the president of the United States and have him sign it. Now, the, course, the point is, if the Republicans can't do that by, you know, December 1st or something, then I can't blame uh, Trump for saying, look, we need a corporate tax cut. Maybe we need to gear this thing to the working class. And maybe we need to raise a, a little bit on the super rich to make the Democrats happy. And if I have to do that, I will. But the point you, you're, you're making, and I am too, is Republicans have to get together and put together a tax bill through both houses consistent with their principles, policies, and beliefs, and get it on the president's desk. I don't, if he don't, he's going to find another way and, and other people to work with. Well, then they're going to get to the point where I, I think the American people will walk away from the Republican Party and say, we've given you everything and you didn't keep any promises. You know, they, they seem to be lacking any identity. Can you, Pat, you've been a Republican your whole life. I've been a registered conservative for a good many years now with one little switch back to the Republican Party for a primary. But I've been mostly a registered conservative in New York. You can do that. And uh, well, and I don't uh, I don't recognize this Republican Party. I don't know what they stand for here. Well, I have to say I was an apostate of the Republican Party back when, I, when I ran reform in 2000. But let me say, and I came back into the Republican Party. But I, I do sort of understand the party, but it's time is passing the Republican Party by. Time is passing the Congress by. I mean, Mitch, I can understand what he's saying, but he's talking 1970s or something. He's got to get the stuff in done. And, you know, there, it comes to a point where excuses don't work anymore. And and what Trump is saying is, fine, you can explain that to the folks when you go back home, but I'm going to get a deal done by X date, and if you don't get me the bill, I'm going to go work with Pelosi and Schumer and get as much as I can, because I believe in getting things done, and I want a successful presidency, and I want to do most of what I promised or as much of what I promised as I can. Well, I like the president's agenda. I think it's a. I think it's Reagan-esque. Is there, is there anything in his agenda... Maybe short of trade. And, and I know you agree with the president on trade, but anything short of the president's agenda that you could argue is not conservative? No, I think he's got his agenda, as I see it, is populist, conservative, economic patriotism on trade. I, you know, I think control the borders. I agree with I agree with those senators cutting back on legal immigration, secure the borders, stop the illegal immigration, send the illegals back. I agree with all this. I would say stay out of these foreign wars. But in but there's there's a general. And then the other side is sort of the older conservative that, that, that Trump defeated. But many of the ideas, I mean, I like the ideas on Federalist Society judges.
these injustices. That's excellent. I'm all for it. So there's a lot of a huge amount we agree on, but you got to start getting it done. I mean, well, this is the problem. This is, this is the bare. This is the end isn't working. This is the bare minimum for me. The bare minimum is the president's tax plan. All right, if they have to go to 16% corporate tax to make the numbers work, 17%, I can live with it. If it goes much higher, I really think they don't understand what conservatism means. I, I agree. Let me tell the, you. Look, these corporations are, I mean, small business is the primary hire and people that, that employ people in the United States of America. If it were up to me, I would take the small businesses, about 99% of them, I would eliminate the corporate income tax on that. And I go along with your larger corporations, 15% on that, repatriate those monies. And, you know, I would tell you, if, if Trump has to, and he's got to cut a deal, you know, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's the top one-tenth of one percent or whatever it is. Right. I would go along with Bannon's 42 or whatever it is to get the thing done. If the Republicans won't do their end. well, that's the risk we're going to run. I mean, I don't agree with Bannon one bit about you know. I, listen, we you give the middle class their tax cuts because they pay the the burden of taxes anyway. Corporations don't pay taxes; they pa they pass those funds on to the consumer. So the consumer benefits that way. But more importantly, you incentivize those corporations and the multinationals. Sure. They've got trillions. They won't bring it back to the U.S. if the government's going to take 30, 35, 40 well, percent. Let me tell you something else about the corporate tax. Yeah. You cut it down to 15 percent. And what's going to happen is a lot of these headquarters companies all abroad that move abroad, they're going to say 15 percent in the U.S. Let's move the headquarters there if it's all, as long as we can make it long term. The lower the corporate tax, the more the incentive here, the more the incentive to produce here and everything. And so that, that makes all the sense in the world. You're right. Reagan used to tell me, you know, corporations don't pay taxes. People do. The people pay the taxes. They pass it on. But I think the freest money in all of this are the multinationals because it's so much of it. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, and people, if they don't understand the multinational corporations, they're in the business to make money, not throw it away. So you let them in at 10% or less and incentivize them to build in Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Missouri, Florida, any state that needs assistance, that needs economic growth, where you have millions looking for jobs. Well, you get right. I would tell them, look, you get, you can bring it all home. Your three or five trillion, whatever you got over there, at ten percent, but you got to get it home within two years. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Invest and by the way, they'll be you happy. Get home in two years, you can you can face Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know, get the money in fast. But the idea is, you want them to bring the money here. Look sure. at what. Remember when Ireland cut their their corporate taxes to the sure, lowest in the industrialized world? <laughs> by the way, our pe our peeps did that, Pat. I mean, you know, those are your people. Um, right? uh, of course, I'm. You know what an Irish seven course meal is, right? Six, you know what it is. <laughs> And what else? No, a six pack and a potato. <laughs> By the way, if uh, if I said that about anybody else but myself, uh, one good thing about the Irish is they make ethnic jokes about themselves. That's it. That's the only people I'll make ethnic jokes about, and it's all true. I mean, if you've ever been on one Irish wake, you know it's all true. There's no lying about it. Uh, all right, just kidding, of course. Eight hundred nine four one Sean, a toll free telephone number. More with Pat in a minute. And as we continue, Patrick J. Buchanan is with us. We'll get to your calls also coming up. We have the latest also on Hurricane Irma now bearing down on Florida, all of South Florida, and the entire state. Every city is going to be hit and hit hard. And we'll get an update from Joe Bastardi coming up later in the program. Uh, Pat Buchanan, you know, notice how the president did a really good job with Texas. And the governor did a really good job. And, and frankly, every local politician, with the exception of the Houston mayor, that said, everybody, don't listen to what you were told. Now go back to your homes. Forget him. But everybody worked together. Lives were saved. Monies are now being sent. You know, frankly, a, a right purpose and role for the American government. Uh, when our fellow neighbors are in need, we're going to help them out. we got to help them rebuild. And the only thing they can pick on is Melania's shoes. <laughs> I know had worse by, by the way, the, the, the exhibit A that Trump did a great job. <laughs> you got to admire the media. You really do. <laughs> you really, I, I, I don't admire them at all. I'm sick of them. I will say that they're, they're so miserable and dreadful. I mean, there are times, I mean, I thought Trump went down there and he, look, he's not a touchy feely type, but he's down there clearly cheering these people up. I'm with you. We're going to help you out. You know, that's his style. And so they, they say 
he didn't hug anybody. He wasn't in Houston. <laughs> yeah, no, he didn't. He didn't show. He didn't hug enough people. <laughs> he didn't hug anybody. There's no Houston. empathy. <laughs> No, he just went down there giving out food, making sure everything's working, making sure that there's enough people on the ground for rescue, coordinating with the governor and local officials. You know, many of these, I feel sorry for some of these journalists. They really are. They seem to be just unhappy and miserable. The only thing that makes them happy is if Trump's in trouble. No, it, well, I got to tell you, they're almost like drug addicts at this point because they wake up in the morning and they need their fix and they're addicted to the hatred of Trump. And they, they can't go a day without expressing the hatred or a conspiracy. And all of this is now beginning, I think, to boomerang back. What do you think? Well, I do think I think that, look, uh, I mean, there's no question about it. And I, and I talked to a famous liberal journalist called, you know, talked to me at, off the record and everything. He said, never seen this kind of brutality and bitterness and the attacks on on Trump. And there's no doubt they've damaged him to a degree. But let me say this. Real permanent damage has been done to that to the American media, far more than than in the Agnew case, where it was an argument over whether they sharply disagreed with us or, or not. And they were on the other side on Vietnam and Agnew and Nixon and everything. Here, I think you've got permanent damage done to the media's credibility. And they go so far. And it's I mean, look, I pick up the Washington Post. I've been reading it for my 60 years or something. Some days you pick it up and everything in there. <laughs> You know, uh, unbelievable. It's, it's not attacking Trump. Yeah, I know. I, I, by the way, they call me occasionally for comment, and I'm like, why would I comment to fake news? <laughs> I honestly I and think, that, you know, the fake news thing, I mean, uh, you know, Trump's you that sticks. Everybody's picked that up, and it's not simply a phrase or a, a slur or something. Many, many, many people believe they really just they got a break. They're engineering and pushing a particular agenda. They, they think the we're, Pat, they think we the people are stupid, and we made a mistake. Then, and they think they know better than all of us. And they're so arrogant that that's their mindset. All right, Pap Buchanan, always love having you, my friend. Thank you. 800 941 Sean, if you want to be a part of the program, we'll get an update coming up from our friend Joe Bustardi at weatherbell.com and much more as the Sean Hannity Show continues. is broadcasting now on over 500 radio stations around the world. And now, here's Sean. All right, 25 now till the top of the hour, 800-941-SEAN, our toll-free number. You want to be a part of the program. All right, as we've been telling you all day, it looks like a direct, direct hit. Key Largo, direct hit Miami, Naples. It is now taking a little bit more of a, a westerly turn. I'm talking, obviously, about Hurricane Irma. And it is literally engulfing the entire state of Florida. And it's become, for I know a lot of our friends and neighbors down there, a traffic nightmare. And 500,000 people have been told to leave South Florida. And the gas problem still remains. Empty shelves everywhere, but they're resupplying even as we speak. Mar-a-Lago, in fact, was uh, evacuated, as I've been telling you today. Uh, the governor has made some really good progress on the issue of getting fuel and telling people of Florida where they can get it, as he has coordinated now for two days to get other states to drop their regulations and just bring the, the gasoline in so people can continue their drive to safer territory. Um, but it now has the potential, Hurricane Irma, of affecting every major city in Florida. And we're just warning all our friends in Florida, take take. Take heed to whatever warnings are coming your way. This is the big one. This is not a game. Uh, the official meteorologist of the Sean, Sean Hannity Show, we have Joe Bustardi, weatherbell.com. When did you first send me this note about Hurricane Irma? It feels like such oh, a distant two, memory now. It was uh, 10 days ago on a Tuesday. It's unbelievable. Oh, yeah, the, and there's another uh, one uh, following this, right? Yeah. Well, here's what's going to happen, Jose. It's going to miss those islands. That it's, it's a 
very powerful hurricane, really intensify very quickly. It's going to miss those islands by about 100 miles to the northeast, so it's a glancing blow. But a week from today, we may still be talking about Jose because I think it's going to get stuck between Bermuda, the Bahamas, and the United States and uh, mill around there for several days and may actually be something that we have to watch. But uh, Katia is going into Mexico uh, in the southern Gulf. The entire Pacific Basin, I don't think I've ever seen the Pacific Basin without a tropical cyclone on this day. It's amazing. Uh, The Pacific shut down completely, but all the actions in the Atlantic. And, of course, our main focus is on Irma. All right, let me ask you, they're calling this now the greatest evacuation in history. 650,000 of our Floridian friends now have been ordered to leave Florida. And the FEMA chief, Miami Beach mayor, warning, get out of this now. This is a, this is a devastation, a nuclear hurricane. Is that hyperbole or is that accurate? Well, it's just kind of interesting. At the beginning of the week when I was uh, consulting with our uh, you know, brain trust at Weatherbell, I said, you know, I... I I feel like I should say that, but I don't want to say it. It, It's the equivalent of that uh, type of situation. However, we've got some breaking news here for you. Uh, And I'm getting pretty confident that this turn to the this turn to the north is going to occur uh, at the latter part of the cycle. This will still be a very bad hurricane on the East Coast, but it's now the Florida Keys and southwest Florida. I am extremely concerned that we are going to see benchmark hurricanes. What's a benchmark hurricane? as bad as it's been. So we're talking Donna in southwest Florida. For those of you who live there, you understand it's worse than Charlie. Charlie was very small compared to Donna. And in the Florida Keys, I I am, you know, I can't tell people to get out, but I heard there's 10 to 15,000 people still there. And that is just not the right thing to do, in my opinion. You may get cut off. You may have some of those bridges washed out because this storm is going to cross the Florida Keys and could get as strong, theoretically, as the 1935 Labor Day hurricane, which I've told people, go on and Google it so you can understand what that storm did. Explain to everybody that maybe is in a car and driving and doesn't have the opportunity now to Google this, what that means. Well, what that means is that you're looking at a hurricane where, and I believe what will happen with this, Sean, is that tomorrow it's going to be messing around with northern Cuba and may even go into northern Cuba for a little while. But when it comes out and starts crossing the strait, it's going to start intensifying again. And I still believe it has not reached its strongest point by way of barometric pressure. I think that is probably going to occur uh, sometime late Saturday night and Sunday. It is also going to be delayed a little bit in that the landfall is in the Florida Keys. It's the first place very late Saturday night, Sunday morning. But then Marco Island and Bonita Springs and that southwest tip of Florida may take the direct hit during the day Sunday. We're watching this very closely. It is a fluid situation. But I'm becoming, watching, watching what's going on, I think the turn is a little bit later rather than earlier, and that's what's going to lead to this. Um, if you're in any of the evacuation areas and you stay, are you risking your life? Oh, I think so. I, I, I would never stay there. Even in my crazy days, I wouldn't stay there. So I, I think that when you're talking storm surge, and what will happen is even if that storm's on the uh, western side of Florida, Miami's still going to get 100-mile-an-hour wind gust, and probably the East Coast, most of the East Coast to Florida will get that, and that's going to go for Disney, Disney World, too. This thing is going to maintain a lot of power inland because it's so powerful coming ashore, and the entire state, uh, I, I don't think Pensacola is going to get it, or in Tallahassee is going to get it, but the, that entire peninsula is going to be raked by a hurricane, and the, the equivalent, when you get to Jacksonville, will be a Category 1 or 2 type hurricane, Miami may have a Category 2 or 3 type hurricane. And that southwest corner, this could be a Category 5 hurricane even when it hits in there. Donna was a 4. So we're talking about the the threat of the the strongest hurricane that they've seen in that area. So basically my home in Naples is going to be maybe Cat 4 or 5. It's it's not a home. it's It's a condo. Uh, I, I, my objective opinion right now is, yeah, that's that's on the table. No, listen, I'm not. I don't. I'm. I'm not. Wor- you know what I'm worried about? I'm worried about my friends in Florida. I'm worried about. I'm not there. Yeah. You know, as the governor kept saying, and the governor, I, I really think he's done such a good job, and I'm really proud of him. And he's been on this since the minute that he found out about it. And it's really good to see competent government and governing sometimes. Um, so the the bottom line is this. So let's talk about the time frame so people understand what and where and how the entire Gulf 
how the entire state is going to be engulfed. Then we'll go up uh, the eastern coast of uh, the United States and talk about Georgia, Atlanta, and Savannah, and the Carolinas. But let's start with Miami. Let's start with southwest Florida, southeast Florida, and work our way up the state. And When are these people going to be in, in the most danger? Well, I think Miami, the core of the storm is Sunday in Miami. Uh, so as far as the timing goes, I think any time during the morning or afternoon, uh, because it, it's not like we're looking at an eye passage in Miami, uh, the entire uh, six to ten hour period there, it could be hurricane force gusts and there may be a, a period for a couple hours where winds are gusting 100 miles an hour uh, around the Miami area. As far as the Florida Keys go, uh, they get cut off very late tomorrow night, and uh, that continues well into the day on Sunday. And we're, we're talking where this is cr- across the Florida Keys. Again, uh, I'm worried about these bridges uh, getting getting washed out in there. And that, uh, the but place but I, had the, I had the mayor of the Keys on yesterday, Joe, and he basically said the whole place has been evacuated. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good. I, I was told today that there's still some people uh, that – that are, are staying there, so I, I don't know. But uh, as, if the mayor says everybody's out of there, I, that's that's the best thing in the world because I think when you come back, uh, things are going to look. Uh, you may not be able to recognize what happens with the power of this hurricane. The worst part of the hurricane comes in to Naples, Bonita Springs, Marco Island, that area Sunday afternoon into Sunday evening. I think the landfall is sometime between noon and 4 p.m. That's what I'm estimating in that general area and then the storm continues north northeast it passes between tampa and orlando very late sunday night and early monday morning now this is interesting because the south side of that uh, tampa bay and then when the storm goes by the wind comes in out of the northwest that may lead to a lot of flooding around tampa bay they're not going to get the storm surge from the south but when the storm goes by there may be water coming back in from the northwest and as far as the Orlando area goes, I would say they're going to see wind gusts of 100, 120 miles an hour in the Orlando area, even that far inland. So that that's very late Sunday night into Monday. And Monday afternoon, uh, the storm reaches the area to the uh, over Gainesville. I think it's going to pass very close to Gainesville. The center passes to the west of Jacksonville, and that's when they get it the worst in there. Uh, it would probably be a, a, the equivalent of a Category 1 or 2 hurricane for those folks. And then it works its way into Georgia. Uh, Monday night to Tuesday. Uh, all right. So, the, but the thing is, when is it? Then Jacksonville. You said Tuesday, Monday night. Uh, uh, Jacksonville, I think, is getting it uh, during the day. Monday is when Jacksonville has its worst, and then it works its way into Georgia Monday night, Tuesday. The core, the core of the storm. Of course, it's a large storm, and things start. I mean, if you're going to start looking at timelines for when tropical storm winds and hurricane force winds occur probably six hours before the center um, is when the hurricane force winds occur and uh, 12 to 18 hours uh, with the tropical storm force. So there are going to be some places in South Florida that are going to be under a 48-hour duration of tropical storm force winds and theoretically anywhere from 12 to 18 hours of hurricane force winds. All right, let me ask this. Um, Then it goes into Georgia, and the way the cone looks right now, Joe Bastardi, is that it looks like it's hitting the entire state how bad is it going to be from Atlanta to Savannah and then northern Georgia and then into the Carolinas? Well, it's spreading out and weakening. And let's remember the cone is the, not the, the cone of influence of the hurricane. It's the possible track. In other words, what you're seeing is the, uh, the uncertainty uh, being analyzed over there. But I think Atlanta may, uh, may see winds 50, 60 miles an hour uh, very late in the day, Monday, Monday night on Tuesday uh, for a while. And uh, a lot of heavy rain. But I don't think... I don't think this is going to produce the rain amounts Harvey did and that this is going to get way, way inland. Remember when we were talking about Harvey, I told you it was going to stop uh, very close to the Gulf and keep pulling in moisture. So this is going to, it's going to produce flooding rains. There's no question about that. But it will be slow. Uh, it will be weakening, and it will be cutting itself off mm-hmm. from the uh, source of moisture. So the rain amounts should not be as, uh, as prolific in Georgia and into the wow. southeast, though still heavy. All right, we're going to see you on Hannity tonight. When we come on the air tonight, where's this storm going to be? Will Florida be seeing the beginnings of this? Well, some of the outer bands may be starting to affect Florida by then, the southeast part of Florida. But the real core of the storm will be to the southeast of Andros at that time. And hopefully uh, I'll have a better definition as to whether I'm absolutely sure on this track. As I said yesterday, uh, if it turns 50 to 60 miles further west, this would happen. It looks to me like it's going to try to do that. All right, Joe, you've been phenomenal for the audience all week. You've been phenomenal over Texas. 
Um, your accuracy has been pinpoint perfect as usual. You study the history of all of these events more than anybody else I know, and you're so generous in sharing your knowledge. And, you know, I like when you're off just a little bit because then we can give you a hard time. But, you know, what you're really doing here is helping people save their lives and, and even in some cases help save property because they can take some precautions. Obviously, you can't protect everything, but uh, you've been amazing. We love you. Thank you so much for uh, doing this for us all week. We really appreciate it. All right, Joe Pistardi, you can follow him all weekend on weatherbell.com. And I'll be honest, I, I don't know anybody in weather that has been – is accurate or who has enough as much background and history as he does i mean you know we give him a hard time when he well the 1929 hurricane but the reason we go back and look at the history is because the history shows a pattern and there's actually path patterns of these particular storms and a lot of people that work in meteorology don't know any of this history so it gives us context and texture and i think it gives him a a level of accuracy in in a science that we know is imperfect but you know thank god we uh, we now have the ability to find these storms and see where they're going before they ever happen I and mean, could you imagine you don't have any forecasting you don't have any satellite imaging and all of a sudden you're living in florida you're going along your mem- merry day on saturday morning and here comes a cat five and you have no clue well that's what it was like for generations of people that's how hard it was for all of them uh tr- wait can we just tell one quick story I wouldn't normally do this to you. But so you're breaking in in the middle of my very impactful, you know, because we've advanced as human beings in society, we can now use information to save lives. And, and science, although this is imperfect, gives us answers to problems. And that's a very when profound point. When you're on point. my time, I can reclaim it. I'm reclaiming my time. <laughs> reclaiming so my funny. time. Reclaiming my time. Go ahead. Um, reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time. Committee. Go ahead. Go ahead. So funny. Lauren reclaiming found, my time. Lauren found this article. Yeah. <laughs> if only I made the money that Mnuchin had. No. Um, that this couple is married 75 years. God bless them. 103 and 94. Their names are Harvey and Irma. Can you imagine? Well, I don't think anybody's associating them with Harvey and Irma but the it's hurricane. Just so they tragic. Are. They are. That's why there's a news article about Harvey and Irma. Thank you, Lauren. Oh, thank you, Lauren. Can we tell the Lauren story yet, or is that still untouchable? That's at this up point? to Lauren. No, a hundred percent no. Well, you want to say something nice about me? Every time I say I'll, I'll abide by your wishes, I expect something nice to be said. I love you. You're the greatest person on the planet. I'm the best boss ever. <laughs> That's a given. Oh, see, I'm not, I can't, I can't turn against that. This Do is why I'm your read. I'll, I'll never be able to succeed in this regard because I can't be that nice. Oh no, we have a bet on on whether or not Linda's hateless returns before I Christmas. I told you I retired. You didn't retire. You say you're a changed woman. I am a changed woman. Oh, good grief! I I, I I bet it's before Christmas, and I'm putting a lot of money on that. Um, and I think that's cash in the bank. No. Nope. Last reminder on this Friday, you, somebody you know, needs a job. Well, a job seeker never pays a fee at ExpressPros.com. 18,000 jobs available on any given day, 800 locations around the country. That's ExpressPros.com. All right, that's all the time we have. Full live coverage tonight at 10. It's all hurricane. It will engulf all of Florida. For all of you in Florida, you are in our thoughts and prayers. We'll have the latest on the forecasting and how to stay safe tonight at 10. Have a great weekend.